right, so what I'd like to do tonight is focus just a little bit on something I covered in the uh, Shabbat thought, and that is something that many people don't realize, and that is that the term the Ten Commandments don't does not exist in Hebrew in the Hebrew Bible. The way that you would say Ten Commandments would be Aseret HaMitzvot. Aseret meaning ten from the word Eser, and Mitzvot of course, meaning commandments. It does not exist in the Hebrew Bible. What you have in the Hebrew Bible, the few times that uh, what, what we call the Ten Commandments is uh, referred to, for example, in Exodus chapter 34, is called Aseret Hadvarim. Aseret Hadvarim. Now, the problem is <clears throat> you can't translate davar into one word in English. It does not mean commandment. I mean, the word mitzvah is a commandment. The word davar does not, not mean a commandment. So the Bible does not call it the Ten Commandments. It calls it the Ten Devarim. Now, what are Devarim? Well, the Hebrew word davar can mean an, a, an object, a thing. The Hebrew word davar can also mean a word, uh, a speech act. Uh, the word davar can mean uh, something that is done or considered. So the best way to translate aseret hadvarim would be something like the ten utterances, the ten utterances of God, the ten speech acts of God, or something like that. Uh, so the way that the uh, early translators translated the Bible, the first translation being the Septuagint into the Greek, they chose the word deka, uh, deka logos, which actually works because the uh, Greek and then Latin word logos re refers to, uh, if you know, uh, for example, in the New Testament, that the logos became flesh, the mind of God became enfleshed in, uh, in Jesus. Uh, you know, Stoic philosophy believes uh, the logos to be the mind of God. When we say psychology is the logos of the psyche or the theory of the soul. So the word logos actually has such a range that Decalogue is probably the best way to translate a seret Hadvarim. Um, now, the rabbis of the Talmud Mishnaic period, they didn't use Aseret Hadvarim when they referred to this. Interestingly, they more or less ignored what the Bible said. They didn't use Aseret Hadvarim. In Hebrew, it's Aseret HaDibrot. So if you look up in Hebrew, if you write in Hebrew Aseret HaMitzvot, it'll redirect to Aseret HaDibrot. Just assuming that you're an ignoramus and don't know what you're talking about. I kept trying to find, does anybody talk about Aseret HaMitzvot? And my search engine would not let me look it up. It said, you probably mean Aseret HaDibrot. I said, no, actually I don't, but I couldn't get it from the search engine. Anyway, Aseret HaMitzvot does not occur anywhere in the Bible and really anywhere in the, in the Hebrew language. So what is a Dibur? Why did they change Davar, Aseret HaDvarim, to Aseret HaDibrot? Here's the theory. Uh, as uh, Hebrew turned into the Aramaic language, the singular of Aser Hadibrot, uh, in Hebrew the word Diber functions as a verb, obviously, but also as a noun. So Dibrot is the plural of Diber, which reads onto the Aramaic word Memra, that both have a sense of revelation from God. So a Dibra or a Memra is, more, is like Logos, it's the speech of God, as it were, taking hold of somebody. Then they backformed it from uh, Dibra to Dibur. All right, so Dibur, if, if you look in the Mishnah and the Talmud, the Dibur in the Mishnah and Talmud means a revelatory act. So, for example, when uh, Jacob went down to Egypt, it says, Anus al yidei ha-Dibur. Now, it wasn't a revelation, it was some speech act of the divine. So Dibra uh, backformed into Dibur, uh, the plural of Dibur, according to the Hebrew of the Mishnah, which is not perfect Hebrew, became Dibrot instead of Dvarim. So when you, when you hear Aseret HaDibrot, it's a vestige of Aramaic that prefers Aseret HaDibrot over Aseret HaDvarim. It's just the way the Hebrew language developed, but they preferred Aseret HaDibrot to Aseret HaDvarim. So how did it become Ten Commandments? Well, so you had uh, in the Greek, Dega Logos, or the Decalogue. It continued in Latin, in the Vulgate. The first English translation of the uh, Bible uh, is called the Tyndale translation. They just said the ten verses. They didn't know what to do with it. 
the Geneva Bible, which was the next English translation, called it the Ten Commandments, but even they knew that wasn't correct because a uh, davar is not a mitzvah. King James followed suit, and again, I think because they were just befuddled, how do you translate aseret hedvarim? Davar does not mean mitzvah. It's a compromise, and then it just comes in the Hebrew, Hebrew language that I was thinking about it. Can we fix this? And we can't because there's a movie called The Ten Commandments, so it's stuck. There's no way we're going to say the Decalogue with Charlton Heston. It's going to be called the Ten Commandments. So I'm not going to try to fight that. But I want us to consider, I'm going to have two last paragraphs of thought here. One, the rabbis did not want to call it a mitzvah. They want to call it a dibur. And why is that? So I'm going to summarize a few commentaries. They said, because they're not mitzvot, especially the first one. I am the Lord your God. I, I am Adonai your God who took you out of Egypt to be your God. That is not a mitzvah. That's not a command to do anything. People say it's a command to think something. Actually, it's a revelatory statement. I'll just dilate on that just a little bit. Much more tomorrow, by the way, I want to bring the Midrash in. Um, why would a fact, I brought you out of Egypt, which people probably had it all, you know, in their short-term memory, it had just happened. Why that, does that go from something obvious to a dibur, a revelation? So here's a thought that I have. Uh, I've shared this many times, but when I was in high school, I remember sitting in synagogue and seeing the following phrase. Uh, I'll, I'll look up the exact verse for next time. It says, you shall have equal weights and measures, which means don't cheat in commerce. You know, when you have your weight and you want to weigh someone else's grain, make sure you have the correct weight. And then it says, I am Adonai who took you, took you out of Egypt. I'm paraphrasing. And I remember thinking to myself, well, that's a non sequitur. What does having equal weights and measurements have with, I am Adonai, your God, who took you out of Egypt? And like a flash, it said, I, this is my paraphrasing. God says to us, I didn't take you out of Egypt for you to cheat each other. I took you out of Egypt as slaves to Mount Sinai, to a land where you could form your own state of justice and, and true worship of the divine, so you could corrupt yourselves like the world before uh, uh, Noah and the world of Sodom and Gomorrah. So we're called upon uh, to remember Again, the, the, the Haggadah says every person is required to see him or herself as personally having come out of Egypt. Why? Because then we respect our life. We respect our freedom. We respect the rule of law. We respect the aspirations of a just and moral society. That's what's contained in, I am Adonai, your God, who took you out of the land of Egypt to be your God. So it's not just a fact, something that happened. It's a value statement that is supposed to permeate the consciousness of the people of Israel. So when they said these are called aseret ha-dibrot, they want to, for us to look at each of the so-called Ten Commandments and understand them not as a law, a rule, a regulation, a do or a don't, but as I said in my Shabbat thought, the tip of a pyramid of meaning and the, we are bidden to go down into that tip. I can't get rid of the idea of the pyramid of meaning ever since uh, Richard Abusa pointed out to me that the uh, Tsohar was a, uh, a deck prism. So whenever I think of the prism, I think of the, uh, the prism of meaning going out down into the depths of the soul, paraphrasing from the, uh, uh, the Baal Shem Tov. Now here's a second, because there's a little bit of adult education uh, here going on tonight. Uh, that the word Ten Commandments does not occur in the Bible. It's called Aseret HaDevarim or Aseret HaDibro. So whenever you say Ten Commandments, realize it's actually not in the Bible, but it's the best we can do. The second thing I want to point out to you, now anybody here who has a Christian background, you already know this, but many uh, Jews who have never read the New Testament don't know this, that um, what is called Pentecost, which if I'm not mistaken happens on Sunday, means 50 days. So if you look in the uh, Acts of the Apostles, chapter 2, uh, the early Christians in Jerusalem were meeting together for Pentecost. So they are actually meeting to celebrate the holiday of Shavuot, which had already become the holiday of the giving of the Torah. And while they're, they're gathered together in, in some large place, because we find out later that 3,000 people uh, became uh, Christians on that day, mean, meaning followers of Jesus, um, Suddenly, they, uh, there is a description of what happened in the room that is taken mostly directly from Exodus chapter 20, from Isaiah, and from Ezekiel. 
By the way, uh, tomorrow we're going to be look, we're instead of the regular Torah reading for the second day of Shavuot, we'll read the Ten Commandments, and we'll be looking at the Haftarah from Ezekiel. So we're going to treat tomorrow as if it's the first day of Shavuot. So what the authors of the New Testament were saying, and the book of Acts seemed to be written as a, as a continuation of the Gospel of Luke, if I'm not mistaken, uh, they, they, what they're communicating is, this was the revelation of Mount Sinai to the early Christians. They're describing the, their gathering on Shavuot, Shavuot as the Holy Spirit enrapturing them, and there was a sense that they were swept up in this moment of rapture with the, the spirit of, um, of, uh, of, of Jesus, of God slash Jesus. Then Peter uh, stands up and talks. And, um, you know, I, I, uh, I'm, I'm not a Christian, but I can appreciate um, the, the beauty of, of religious speech. If you read the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 2, and again, we don't know how historical this is, but whoever wrote uh, this chapter, wrote a beautiful statement to everybody there, which was actually the beginning of Christianity. When you read the four Gospels, after the crucifixion and the resurrection, it's a very uneven tale uh, where some people saw Jesus, Jesus appeared a few days later, and you don't have any moment where, and that's how Christianity began. So the four Gospels, after the, uh, the crucifixion and the resurrection, by the way, um, not all of them have the resurrection, it, it, it doesn't end in a tight manner. So when does Christianity actually begin in the New Testament? It begins in the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 2, where Peter describes what has happened, and then somebody calls out, brother, what shall we do? I don't know what the Greek is, but the English is, brother, what shall we do? And he said, here's what you do. And Peter describes what the early church should do, and that is begins, in, in my mind, the formalization of Christianity. So what's fascinating for me is that you might say the spiritual meaning of Ma'amad Har Sinai, of standing at Mount Sinai, where natural phenomena take on a life of their own, where the Spirit of God moves through people, and it's not so much the particular of each davar or each dibur, but the sense of the divine addressing us. And I, I love that sentence um, in the Acts of the Apostles where the people call out, brother, what shall we do? And I want us all to think for a moment. Um, you have a moment when the spirit of the divine passes through you. You have a moment where you say, life has meaning. Life has purpose. There is something called the divine. What I think and do and say matters. And then you say to yourself or someone says to you, brother, sister, what shall I do? And you say to yourself, now that I've had this experience, what shall I do? And think of that as a sentence that not just begins a religion, but I think translates all religious experience into some kind of form of thinking and doing and practicing and of course, if enough people agree, then it becomes a community, it becomes a religion. So as we celebrate the uh, holiday of Shavuot, everybody should go back and read uh, the book of Exodus, chapters 19 and 20, required reading for tomorrow. And if you want to expand your horizons, go to the New Testament and read Acts of the Apostles, chapter 2, and you'll see the structural similarity between Exodus, chapter 20, and Acts of the Apostles, chapter 2, which is people being filled with the Spirit of God and asking, what do we do next? So what I'd like to do tomorrow is pick just one or, or two of the Devarim, the so-called one of the Ten Commandments, bring in the Midrash, the Shemot Rabbah, and take a deep dive in how the rabbis uh, peered in deeply into the commandments and discovered and shaped uh, entire worlds of meaning.